do that. Okay, so um, where are we in the class and what do we wanna do next? Um, so what I'd like to do is just kind of frame our status here and talk a little bit about Turing reducibility. So let me motivate this by sharing some other content here and we'll look at, um, we'll look at a, you know, one of the solutions from one of the students did from problem set four. This is my lecture, but I'm gonna put up a, a split screen of solution here if I can. Let's see. Here we go. So you've been working hard on doing proofs of various halting theorems. And it's not always easy. We know that. We find them difficult too. And you had a lot of tools, basically from mathematics and computer science to do some of these proofs. And we've given you the answers as well now. And um, here's an example of a proof by contradiction of the fact that the equiv function can't exist. This is by a student in the lab. I didn't get a chance to ask him and his partner for permission to use it, so I'm not gonna give the name, but this was a good proof. Um, some pretty concise code here on the left. There's some words here that describe why this is a good proof, and you obtain a contradiction for why equiv can't exist. So you can meditate on this a little bit, see if you understand what's going on, one of the misconceptions about mathematics, and this comes from the fact that we started learning mathematics as arithmetic, is there's only one way to do a problem. There are actually many ways to prove these theorems. This is just one. It's a very good proof. This is actually a novel proof. We have other proofs by contradiction, but this was very interesting for us to see. Uh, and we meditated on it for a while before we decided that this was a good proof. Not that it was questionable, we just have to think about it. So one of the things is this took me about 10 minutes to parse through and try to figure out if this was really correct. And I think it might've taken the TAs and perhaps students even longer to think about that. And don't you wish there was a single simple recipe for proving halting problems uh, were in, intractable or impossible? That would be really nice. Something like induction, right? Wouldn't that be nice if we had a recipe for those things? And we'd find that really useful in the class. And if I could, I would share my, uh, have you raise hands, but I think you would find that pretty useful. So today we're gonna show it to you. So this doesn't obviate the beauty or the sophistication of proofs by contradiction like this. It just means that there's another way that's somewhat more straightforward, but it requires the math. And you have to learn that math first. You actually know it, it sets and functions. And one has to be motivated to learn it, but you are because it's easier to solve halting problem theorems with this technique. So several ways of doing these kind of problems. Uh, in, in essence, we've been doing sort of artisanal halting problem proofs. We had to for Safeify, right? We didn't have any basis. We didn't know any problems were hard. And you can do more problems like that. You can sort of put them together as if you're some kind of fancy chef in a little cafe coming up with your own ingredients. And these are, these are excellent proofs. But today we're gonna to show you a recipe for doing this, proving undecidability. So it's very easy once you master, it's very powerful. It uses our newfound understanding of sets and functions. And it's called Turing reducibility. And some of you might call it a wrapper, like you put a wrapper around a function to show some other function can't be written. So basically it's the, what the fit, to make an analogy with physics, it's a grand unified theory of decidability or undecidability. Uh, and how can you decide that, how can you prove that functions are Im impossible, cannot exist? In other words, that you can't program them. And that's what we're gonna try to talk about today. So let me just go a little further about this and make a few comments. So one is a comment on terminology. Now, in computability theory, computational complexity, and in computer science. A reduction is something different from the function reduce. So often in mathematics, there's some overloading of terminology. In other words, what can happen is we can use different words to mean different things. And this is sort of, uh, you know, kind of a 
it's sort of unfortunate in some ways. Uh, we kind of wish that we had a way to have different names for all the different um, things we want to do. But what I want to tell you is that the term reduction in computability theory and computer science has nothing to do with the function reduce. It's a completely different concept. So in computability theory, which is what we're learning now, whether functions are computable or not, a reduction is an algorithm for transforming one problem into another problem. And, uh, you know, we can use that. You might use that to show that the second problem is at least as difficult as the first problem. So nothing to do with reduce, accumulate, or fold. Okay. So let's kind of go through this. What I, what I want to do here is, is give you the concept of what we're talking about. And to be careful about this, I've actually written out all the proofs and all the details for you to read later and check and then ask me questions about. Happy to go over anything in this lecture, but I don't wanna go through every detail of the proofs in the lecture. I want to tell you what they're about, motivate them and then let you check them. So one of the reasons for doing this is that proving things are uncomputable or computable is one of the major themes in both computer science and mathematics. So there are a roadmap for basically all of mathematical or most of mathematical computer science. So this is what computer scientists actually do. You'll see it in courses ahead and Turing reducibility named of course after Alan Turing. It's a system or roadmap for organizing and harnessing all the facts and techniques we've been using. And you can't be a computer scientist without a reasonable understanding of reductions. In addition to computability, as we'll talk a little later, it's also the foundation for a topic called NP completeness. I'm sure you've heard about things being NP complete, but today we'll learn a little more about what that actually means. And of course, you can't possibly take or pass CS330 without a reasonable understanding of reductions, which are used all the time. So again, up to now, basically we did variants of our proof for the classical halting problem, and we constructed our own proofs. Um, but basically there's a recipe for doing this, and now you have the maths to do that. So let's kind of review what we know about the halting problem just to think about this. So we know that there's at least one problem that we constructed by hand that is uncomputable, right? This is the classic halting problem. We proved the safe question mark function. Now, um, in, in what I'm talking about today, we're gonna to refer to algorithms by their scheme as scheme procedures and their names. And let's just look at a, a version we had recently on a problem set, which is sort of simple safe. So if the supposed procedure to call it, you know, actually exists, then we're going to say that supposed procedure decides the problem because it says yes or no. It looks at the input, it says less or no. So let's look at simple safe here. Suppose simple safe actually exists, that is given a thunk, it says yes if the thunk halts with an answer, false otherwise. And you've already shown and we've shown that this cannot exist. So you might have shown it by direct contradiction, or maybe you actually discovered the wrapper or reduction technique yourself, which is fine. Um, so I want to just introduce this terminology here that if safe existed, we would say it decided the halting problem. And that means given any pair, a function and an argument, it would return true or false after deciding, that is figuring out whether or not F applied to A halts with an answer. And similarly, we use the same language for a quiv. A quiv would decide a problem of function equivalence and simple safe would decide the halting problem for thunks. So that's a terminology that we'll use here. That's why we say they're undecidable. Now, I, before kind of diving into some of the specifics, what I'd like to do is to um, uh, just put this in perspective and hopefully amuse you a little bit. So the TAs put together some skits that illustrate the utility of our view of the um, halting problem. Namely, that you could be asked by a boss or by a program manager or by someone else to actually think about, hey, is it actually possible to construct certain functions or not? And if you have the theory of computation that is undecidability under your belt, you're able to definitively tell the boss or program manager or funding agency, actually, I can't do that because it's undecidable. Um, and we put the text of these, I think the videos are kind of cute, so I'm gonna show them now. They're pretty, pretty, uh, pretty short. Let's do that. All right. Let me know if you can see and hear these. We'll let these run. 
Hey, Omar, please write out a scheme program called Equip that takes any two scheme functions as input and decides whether or not they are equal as functions. Um, let's see. I don't know how I can figure it out. So I guess I'm just not smart enough. Sorry. That's unacceptable. I'm sorry to inform you that your services will no longer be required here at Yo-Yo Dine Systems. I'm going to hire Shreya. I'm fired? Yes. All right, so that is uh, computability before taking CS230. Here's computability after taking CS230. Hey, Omar, please write a scheme program equip that takes two scheme functions as input and decides whether or not they're equal as functions. I can't. No one can. I actually can prove that this is, this equip function does not exist. But if you could write a quid, you could solve the halting problem, and that's impossible. Cannot cannot be done. You're brilliant, Omar. Would you like a big promotion? Yes, please. All right. So many thanks to uh, Omar and Daniel. And if we have time later, depending on questions we're going to also be able to see their skits about NP completeness. And there'll be a little bit of a possibility to compare and contrast because in NP completeness, you're also able to tell your boss that it's very unlikely you'll be able to write certain kinds of programs. All right, so let's go back to our, um, I'll try to go back to our screen here, let's see. And look at our, our notes here. These notes are already on the web, on the web, so we should be able to go ahead. As always, let you know if you can't see something. All right, so we have the notion that since these functions are saying yes and no about their input, that in some sense they're deciding the problem. That's the term decidability. So let's go back to some things you looked before. And my goal here is just to look at this from the point of view of unifying our knowledge and moving on. So here's the concept. And the concept is basically one of type matching. And now that you know that types are sets, and this has to do with images and ranges and so forth, it should be a little easier than it would have been, you know, a few months ago. So basically what we want to do in a halting problem proof is even though we're trying to prove that it can't work, we're actually trying to build a machine that if all the pieces worked would solve the halting problem. So if you look at this flow chart here, which has inputs and functions and so forth, look at simple safe. The type of thing simple safe takes has to be a thunk, has to be a function of no arguments. Now I'm not saying it existed, but suppose it does. Now, if it exists, then simple safe can say true or false. What we'd like to do is build a machine that if simple safe exists, would actually decide the halting problem, which has a different format. So it takes a pair, F and A, where F is a function and A is an argument. So what we want to do is we want to take something of the form F comma A and transform it into a thunk such that when we do this entire chain here, which is built by function composition, we'll solve the halting problem. So in other words, I take something of the form f comma a, where f is a function and a is an argument, I put it into my reducer, my transformer here, and I, I turn that into a thunk that I could then feed to simple safe. And so this looks in scheme something like this. The transformer over here takes in F and A, and it just returns a thunk. It makes a thunk and returns it. Now, the reason this is kind of neat is that once we have this chain, we're allowed to compose functions. Do you know what it means now to compose functions? We've done it in scheme and we've done it with mathematical functions. You can compose these two functions to actually write safe. And I've done that like this. So look what we've done here. What to write safe, I take the output of Turing reduce one above, which is a thunk, and I apply simple safe to it. And then this chain of things will solve the halting problem. So what we're doing here, the 
the goal of this exercise is that you could do this in many cases. What you do is that you will, you will take the input to the halting problem, for example, and you'll turn it into some other problem that your putative new function is trying to solve. And then by comp compositionality, this all goes together and makes a new function that will decide the halting problem. So it's basically an issue of making the types match up. You can't give f comma a to simple safe because it only takes thumbs, right? That's not gonna work. So you have to take f comma a and transform it into a thumb and then everything will work, assuming it exists. So basically the goal of Turing reductions is as follows. I've already proved that safe can exist. If I can write safe so that it would work, assuming only that simple safe exists, therefore simple safe can exist. The easiest way to do this is function application. So I write a transformer, which I'll call Turing reduce one here. So that's the idea. Let's try a more complicated example. Let's try quiv. So I've written, there are many different ways of doing quiv. We looked at one done by a classmate of yours who used contradiction. We can also use reduction for this. Let's look at the um, flowchart for this. So a quiv only takes a pair of functions and it's supposed to decide whether G equals H. Now we're not saying it does exist, but if it existed, it would. The goal of this exercise is to take the input to the halting problem, namely a thing of the form f comma a like this. We're gonna build a transformer function called Turing reduce like this, takes in a pair f comma a and it returns a pair of functions. So this is really best understood by thinking of types. The type of input to say the halting problem is f comma a f a function a an arbitrary argument the type of input to a quiv is g comma h where g and h are both functions. So the reducer or the transformer function, you can think of it as transformer, takes an f comma a and gives back a pair of functions g and h. And here I've written one for you. There are many ways to do this problem. There's another solution that's on the uh, course website for PS4. I'm not gonna go through the proof here. I'll make some comments about it, but please check this and make sure you understand it. So the goal of this is as follows. Given f comma a, where we don't know whether or not f halts on argument a or not, construct a pair of functions g and h so that g is equivalent to h if and only if f halts on argument a. And I've done that in three lines of code here. So this is an interesting function because as I've said, take an f comma a, return g comma h, G equals H if and only if F halts on argument A. Then with this under our belt, we can make the compositionality happen. We can make this machine happen by just function composition because we've made the types match up. So in other words, a quiv needs a pair of functions. Turing reduce provides that. The halting problem is a function argument pair. Turing reduce takes that as input. Now we can implement safe, which simply applies a quiv to the result of the transformer. Okay, so, and that's what we have here. Now, there are two ways of doing this. I like this transformer way here. You could also write it like this. It's a little less clear, I think. So you can directly write safe. We would also consider this a reduction. So in other words, basically in line, we write safe, we define G and H using a let statement. And then we ask if they're equivalent. Some students find this a little bit clearer. I like to write the transformer because it gives the analogy bet between something very simple here, like simple safe, and the analogy, the analogy between that and equiv. So you always have some method of transforming an instance of, for example, the halting problem into an instance of the problem you're trying to show is very difficult. So you generally have this transformer functions. Here we broke it out into two separate functions, one that does the transformation, one that helps you write safe. Here, we've inlined it basically, the transformation happens in here. Very clean way of doing it. Basically, we define G and H. Again, G equals H as functions if and only if F halts with an arg argument, an answer an argument A. Okay, now 
you also need to write some words um, for this. And you have to say why it is true. The main thing you have to show is that F halts on argument A if and only if function G equals function H. And there's some language here in the notes about some of the, not subtleties of doing that, but some of the practical implications. So now we know something about how to prove these things. And we have this idea of, if you will, writing a wrapper. So some, some students call this a wrapper, W-R-A-P, ah, sorry, right here. Essentially what we've done is we've written a wrapper around a quiv that lets you implement safe. That's a fine way of thinking about it. I don't particularly love it. I like the transformer notion instead, but they're both sort of the same idea. So we have this way of doing this and the things we needed were the notion of types, which are sets, the notion of function composition. All right, so now we've seen some examples of doing this using uh, uh, essentially a form of reduction. That is transforming an instance of a hard pro known hard problem, the halting problem, into an instance of the problem we wish to show was hard. And the main thing is that this entire pipeline here of composed functions, only two composed functions, is guaranteed to decide the halting problem if a quiv exists and works to spec. And that's all you need. And therefore that's a contradiction and therefore the pipeline can't work and therefore the quiv doesn't exist. So this is a nice way to prove things. You can always prove these by contradiction, but reduction is a nice recipe for this. But in order to have a recipe, I have to tell you a little more about what the recipe is. How would you apply this in general? Okay, so to really get a recipe for this, we have to go a little bit into sets a little bit more, not into the theory of sets applying sets. So I need, we've done this before when we counted the set of all scheme expressions. I need to define that set. I'm gonna call it E star. So E star is the set of all possible scheme expressions, right? Now, what is the halting problem then? Well, the halting problem, remember a problem is something that you can decide. So given an instance of it, you look at it, the instance and say yes or no. So a halting problem is a, is a set of instances. Each instance is of the form F comma A. They're in E star. In other words, they're basically scheme expressions and the criterion is F halts on input A. So this is really how the halting problem is defined. And you could think of this as follows, is that if this is the set of all scheme expressions, which I'll call E star, some su subset of them here are instances of the halting problem. In other words, these are things, a point here looks like F comma A, where F applied to A actually halts. Out here, you may have perfectly good functions and arguments where things don't halt. So that's what the halting problem is. Now, in order to make this work, we also need another problem we're interested in, say halting problem on thumps like this, which is also a subset of E star, the set of all scheme expression. So HP sub thunk is a set of all functions such that F halts with, halts with no arguments. And now we can define what a reduction really is. It's not that intimidating given all the stuff you've done with functions, but I wanna help you parse it and see what it is you're proving. So what does it mean to reduce to this notion of reduction? So I don't wanna be talking about the halting problem for thunks or simple safe or anything like that. I wanna talk about an arbitrary problem, which I will call Y, the letter Y. And Y might be simple safe, Y might be a quiv, might be code safe, might be a whole bunch of other things. But the idea is Y is a parameter. When it's your problem, you can then instantiate it and use this definition. So basically the idea as follows, look at the diagram. If R is a reduction, i.e. a mapping from E star to E star, where E star is the set of all scheme functions, each point in E star is either an instance of the halting problem or it's not. Remember, instance of the halting problem is a pair F comma A where F applied to A halts with an answer. So all that we require is the following thing given in this if and only if. Namely that if you start with an instance of the halting problem, then R transforms it into an instance of your new problem Y. If your point in E star is not 
an instance of the halting problem, the function R transforms it into something outside of Y. So most theorists express this by E is in HP if and only if R of E is in Y. But we could also use, if you prefer it, our notion of sets and images and so forth. That is the image of HP under R is a subset of Y and the image of its complement is a subset of the complement of Y. I actually lean towards this definition because I think it's a little more concise, but the second one ties a little more into our views of sets and functions. So now we, we understand why this is going to be um, so useful because it describes the behavior of the reduction function. And the idea can be thought of as follows. So suppose we actually have a reduction like this, right? This is the same picture we had before. We have a reduction that is set up exactly like this. So HP goes to Y and not HP goes to not Y. Well, what we're imagining here counterfactually is that we have an algorithm, a scheme program that will decide why that is given an instance of Y will return true if your instance is in Y and false otherwise. So in other words, we're imagining that having set up this reduction in the proper way, what we have next is a function like this that takes E star to true or false. That's supposed to be true or false like that. And this function is our decider function, let's just call it phi. So the key point here is that functions can be composed. So we know the halting problem can't be decided. If we can decide the problem y, i.e. have a Boolean function that takes E star to true or false and instances of y are true, instances of not y are false, then I can simply compose r and phi and I can decide the halting problem. Therefore, that means that the function phi can't exist. And that's exactly what we did in our cases here. Just we gave them names of things you're familiar with. So look, notice what we did here. We took an instance of the halting problem f comma a, and we produced an instance of something like a quiv. So basically g is equivalent to h, if and only if f halts on argument a. This second part is our decider for a quiv, our hypothetical decider. This is our function phi. Namely, we hypothesize there's a function that can take a function g and h, return true when g equals h, otherwise return false. If that exists, then we can compose the function phi with the function Turing reduce to get a function that would decide the halting problem. Since that's impossible, it immediately implies the non-existence of phi. Now, these steps we'll go through in the class each time, but computer scientists often just show the reduction. You must show the reduction together with this property. So you have to show the reduction together with uh, the property that I mentioned, namely that for the reduction function from E star to E star, H E is in the halting problem if and only if R of E was in Y. So that's our, um, uh, that's our example that we're, uh, uh, okay. Now, I just had a call from a telemarketer that interrupted. So I wonder if someone could let me know if you could still hear me and see me. Yeah, it works. That's good, thank you. Okay, so basically what are the levels of understanding here? The first is to understand that you can make wrappers with W. So what I can do is if I imagine a function like a quiv, if I can write a wrapper around it to write safe, I'm done. I've basically done the reduction. I've shown that if the quiv exists, I can write safe and therefore the quiv can't exist. That's perfectly sufficient for this class. You should know it's called a reduction and you should say that in your proof, but that works. But you must show to do this that F halts on A if and only if G equals H. You have to show that. Equivalently, you can dress it up in the language of transformation, break it out into a helper function that does the transforming. Now, why do I do this? I think it can be clearer because these reductions are always computable, right? They're all, that's by definition, if it's not computable, it's not a reduction. So it's nice to see that the first half of this pipeline is something eminently computable, even though the second is something we're trying to show doesn't exist, but either way works fine. And finally, if you really wanna see the applicability of these things in general, what you're doing here, when I say that F halts on argument A with an answer, if and only if the function G 
equals H, where G and H is the pair produced by R applied to that instance of the halting problem. When I say this, I'm actually saying this definition here, namely that our instance of the halting problem E maps to R of E, which is in my new problem Y, which is a quip. So that's what we're trying to do here. So this gives a general recipe for proving undecidability and it generalizes our problem set and short assignment proofs and some of the proofs on midterm two as well. They all can have the same form and the use of higher order functions are intrinsic and natural for reductions because we're taking functions as inputs and producing new functions. Okay, and there's much more to be said here about looking in the details of the proofs and I invite you to look at that here. Let me mention a couple of things. So first of all, we can chain this and we can diversify this to other problems and we can prove a lot of problems are undecidable. And this is what I meant by we're like biologists trying to classify animals by their strengths and weaknesses. So we can not only show problem why one is undecidable, why two and so forth, there are lots of undecidable problems. And for each one that we care about, we can use these techniques and we can chain these forwards and we can actually derive what's called a hierarchy namely that problems are easier or harder than each other by whether or not they can be reduced to each other. And we'll talk a little more about that later. Okay. Now, I'm gonna give you a tip that I, uh, that's very obvious, but helped me a lot when I was learning this material when I was a grad student, which is a little late actually. I was a late convert. So, the key, this is usually written as follows. So some notation first. In the language of theory, we typically don't use HP. Well, I would, but in the 330, they'll call it K sub TM. And similarly, K sub BT will be the problem for thunks or blank tape. And that's because Alan Turing didn't use the lambda calculus, he used a imagined physical machine with an infinite tape. So KTM is the halting problem, that's just definitional. This is usually written like this. We basically write this with this less than with a T there. So the idea of this reduction is that you're showing that the problem Y is at least as hard as the halting problem, right? Could be equally hard, at least as hard. And this is the setup again that we have for this problem we have a reduction from E star to E star, where E star is a set of all scheme functions. It takes the red oval, which are halting problems, and turns them into Y problems. And the complement of halting problems, it turns into the complement of Y problems, just like we had before. But what's useful here is that, which direction does the reduction go? This is something that's perennially confusing to students and even to researchers. And here's the hint. If you write this down that Y is at least as hard as KTM, which we prove by reducing KTM to Y, the direction of the reduction function goes in the opposite direction to the arrow, as you can see here. So the reduction function goes in the opposite direction from this less than sign, as you can see here from this diagram. So if you remember this fact or this heuristic, you'll never get lost about the direction of the reduction. So the reduction goes in some direction, the hardness symbol goes in the opposite direction because you're showing why is at least as hard. I'll let you meditate on this a little bit to think about it. Okay. We've got a question, Bruce. Um, sure, absolutely. Which is, what is it about the halting problem for which you know it makes it be the, the hardest problem? Is, is there like maybe another notion of hard that makes a different problem maybe more hard in a sense than the halting problem? Great, great question. So from our point of view, um, well, let me just do a little math here. Suppose that I have this, why is it some problem why is as hard as the halting problem? Um, I could also have that why is, that, that the halting problem is at least as hard as why. I could have this as well, which in some sense means that y is equal under Turing reducibility to KTM, just like for numbers. Right, so I could do the reduction the other way too. And in fact, for most of these things, the reduction works in both directions. In other words, I can prove that the halting problem for thunks is equivalent in hardness to the halting problem. I can prove that the equiv is equivalent to the halting problem. 
So you have an equivalence relationship where the less than, less than or equal relationship goes in both directions. So from our point of view, the halting problem is just the first problem we saw. There are a lot of problems that are actually equivalent to it in hardness, and you can do that by doing the reduction in both directions. That may answer the first part of your question, but please tell me in a minute. But yes, there are problems that are harder than the halting problem. Um, and we're not gonna deal with them in this class, but you might see them in 330 or John Wright's structural complexity class. But they're, they're still plenty hard in, in this pur purpose of this class. So in other words, uh, there are problems that are harder than the halting problem but many of those problems uh, are equally hard as well. And to do that, we do the reduction in the other direction as well. And I can tell you, and we might ask you, to prove that actually uh, equiv and simple safe actually have the same complexity. So basically that... we use the halting problem as the basis because we have a very clear proof uh, that the halting problem is intractable. Um, so that's, that's a really good- To reduce everything to halt it, the halting problem. That's, that's, that's correct. However, there's a wonderful thing that happens as you can see from this diagram, is that once that I've shown that any of these problems, halting problem for thunks, halting problem for pi and r, halting problem for you know, argument equals one, halting problem for equivalent, once I've shown that these are at least as hard as the halting problem, I can use them as my basis if I prefer. So once they're established, you can use any of these as the basis for these proofs. And the reason is you've shown they're at least as hard as the halting problem. Does that Thank sound you. good? Yeah. yeah, great question. We'll go into this a little bit later. It's a terrific question. All right. So I now want to tell you what the real payoff of this viewpoint is. So I think you all like the wrappers, and I think you all like the idea of writing safe using your new function to show that the new function can't exist. I mean, that's pretty cool. But this stuff about sets and images and so forth, like, why are we doing this? Well, one thing that we'll touch on in this class and you'll learn a lot more about in 330 and other CS classes is the concept of NP completeness. Now, things are a little different for NP completeness and I want to lead you in a little exercise in thinking about that. So, let me show you where I'm going with this by showing you another picture. So the difference, I'll say this several times so you'll get it if you didn't get it the first time. NP completeness proofs or NP hardness proofs are exactly the same as uncomputability proofs with two fundamental changes. One is, that we don't have a problem that is absolutely rock solid known to be super hard, right? We think it is, and we have other problems that are equivalent to it. So we need to generalize our notion of a hard problem. And second, because NP completeness is about whether or not your programs run in polynomial time, we have to add another condition. So we have to basically add to our reductions that the transformer functions run in polynomial time. And then composition of two functions that are polynomial will give a polynomial. So a way to think about this in a kind of lighthearted way, and then we'll have another skit, is as follows. So there exists a really hard problem that we don't think can be solved in polynomial time. And similarly, there are a whole bunch of other problems that are equivalent to it by reduction. And there exist a lot of famous computer scientists, none of whom know how to solve these problems in polynomial time. The situation we will see is that if you could solve any one of these in polynomial time, then you could do something similar with function composition and you could solve all of them, which seems unlikely given all these famous computer scientists more or less have certified that at present, they don't know how to solve it. And you could say that to your boss. So this is a slightly different situation that I'm gonna have our dip, us dip our toe into. With computability, we have a rock solid proof. We know the halting problem is undecidable. We know reductions are sound. We can write these wrappers. We can prove other problems are uncomputable. 
no boss can tell you to write those programs. Completely impossible, right? Well, they can tell you, but it can't be done. Here, we're relying on the fact that a bunch of problems are equivalently hard. Everyone has said they don't know how to solve them, and solving one would solve all of them because they can be reduced to each other. So I have a little exercise here, and I'm going to ask uh, Alex to share a little so quiz. I'm going to ask you all to fill out this form for the purpose of the exercise, and then we're going to have another skit. By the way, if you're not comfortable signing this, and you know how to solve the Hamiltonian cycle problem in polynomial time, please send me your proof. After we check it, we'll nominate you from the, for the Turing Award and the Fields Medal and the MacArthur Genius Award, because um, at the moment, no one knows how to do this. So please fill out this form. I'll give you a minute to do that and then we'll come back with a skit in a minute. But I wanna have you all certified that you're famous computer scientists and you don't know how to devise an algorithm to decide Hamiltonian cycle. I've also signed this form, has, have the TAs. Okay, good. I'll give you a second to do, do the quiz. Can we sign it since we're not famous? <laughs> If you've taken CS230 with this staff, you're already famous or about to be. Okay. You're already based on your accomplishments in the class in the 99.99 percentile of people that understand mathematical computer science. And that includes industry and academia. So you're doing well. All right, so while you're completing that, or if you already have, I wanna show you some more skits, courtesy of Omar and Daniel. The main point of these skits is what to do when your boss says, solve this problem, please. And it's a little different, as you'll see, from The halting problem of Turing reducibility, although it's similar. And I want you to see the similarities between these. So let's look at these. Let's look at NP completeness before CS230. Take it away, Daniel and Omar. Omar, please write a program to solve the Hamiltonian graph problem quickly. Um, how quickly you want? Uh, I don't know. Polynomial time will do. Ah. Uh, I don't know how, I can't figure it out. I guess I'm just too dumb. That's unacceptable. I'm sorry to inform you that your services will no longer be needed here at Video Dine Systems. I'm going to hire Alex instead. You mean I'm fired? I'm sorry, yes. Okay, now we see NP completeness after CS230. And go. Omar, please write a program to solve the Hamiltonian graph problem quickly. Mm. What's the matter? Have you proven it's impossible again? Oh, no, no, no. Then you can write it, maybe. Oh, no, I can't, but neither all, well, neither can all of these other famous people. So you can't solve it by firing me and hiring anyone else, including Alex. I'm convinced. May I give you all my stock options, please? Yes, gladly. Okay, so now we've seen what we're trying to get at. Now, for those of you, we're just trying to give you an idea about how this works. Right, we're edging into this topic. 
And I want to sort of define this notion by going back to our, sorry, our screen again, this notion of what does it mean to have things that are NP complete? How does this build on our notion of Turing reducibility? What do we have to do here to make this work? Okay, so the basic idea of this is a little bit different, right? The um, way I would describe this is with the halting problem, we have absolutely in a rock solid fashion proven that at least some halting problems are undecidable. You can't program them, right? With NP completeness, basically the informal notion of NP complete is that if a problem's NP complete, it's very unlikely you can write a polynomial time algorithm for it. But the problem is we don't actually know for sure that these problems are have that property. If this was another discipline, the evidence would be overwhelming, but from the point of view of mathematics and computer science, we're not 100% certain. And so we take a different approach while we try to figure this out. Namely, we again show that all these hard problems can be reduced to each other and also a large congregation of computer scientists are pretty convinced that they don't know how to solve these problems. So this is a different kind of job security because if your boss gives you a problem to compute that are NP, NP complete, you can first say that it's equivalent to lots of other hard problems. And second, that he can't replace you by hiring another well-trained computer scientist because they will also not be able to do it because they have written many times that they don't know how to solve these yet. So right now the bets are on trying to prove that this is actually um, impossible. So let's go into this a little bit, start talking about NP completeness. All right, so here's what we need to make this work. And again, I'm gonna sort of sketch this out, let you look at some of the proofs, ask questions, we'll do some in recitation, we'll take a little time for this, but I want you to sort of see this. The main lesson of this is that the backbone of NP completeness is the notion of reduction. So even if for some reason, and I can't imagine anyone who would feel this way, even if someone doesn't care about the halting problem and, com and computability, NP completeness is a related topic that builds on our knowledge of these things. So to develop a theory of NP completeness and a definition, we need a couple of things. We need a notion of what is a hard problem, something like the halting problem. And we'll use reductions, but we have to, the reductions have to be efficient. Like we said, nothing about how efficient our reductions were before, our Turing reducer transformer functions. Now the reductions have to be polynomial time. Otherwise, the framework is precisely the same. So again, uh, this is why I wanted you to actually have an idea of some hard problems. We're gonna consider two problems, say, a certifiably hard problem, Hamiltonian cycle, and some other problem, maybe traveling salesman problem, something else, which we're trying to show is also hard, technically no harder than, and we wanna develop a theory of how to do this. Okay, so instead of the halting problem, what we're gonna do is we're going to define another kind of hard problem, namely Hamiltonian cycle. We'll add a requirement to the reduction that, that basically the reduction, reduction M has to run in polynomial time, right? So this, the decider obviously has to run in polynomial time. They both have to be polynomial time. So we have a concatenation of a reduction, which is polynomial time, and a decider, which is a Boolean function. They both have to be polynomial on the side of the input and polynomials cascaded in this way will also be polynomial. And then we have to show that if both the reducer and the decider are polynomial time, then the composition is polynomial time. So let's think about doing this and do some sort of definitions here. So the first is that if you go into a class where you know maybe you haven't thought as deeply about reductions as we're doing in this class, you might find the definition of a polynomial time reduction a bit intimidating, unless you're a mathematician already. So polynomial time reduction, 
is exactly like the reductions we had. We just add the requirement that the reducing function has to be efficient, has to run in polynomial time. That's all we're adding. So that's pretty neat. That's the same thing as a familiar concept. And we have the same criterion here that if we're reducing A to B, that our instance problem is in A if and only if the image under R is in B. So this is kind of a similar concept, although we're still trying to figure out how do we use this. Now, some of you would ask very reasonably, what are these, what are these things? What are these classes of P and NP? What do they really mean? So for the purpose of this class, we'll define a class of problems. And now you know what a problem is, right? A problem is a thing that lives in E star, right? So the complexity class P is the set of all decision problems that is Boolean functions that can be solved by an algorithm in time that's polynomial in the input size. Now, what about the class NP? So this is kind of interesting. So this is the class of, again, decision problems. So the class of Boolean functions where you can check the solution quickly in polynomial time, but you can't necessarily search for it. So typically it means that if you guess a solution or if someone gives you a solution, you can verify it in polynomial time in the size of the input, but it doesn't mean that you can necessarily search through or enumerate them. And this is one reason that computer scientists really believe that proofs and programs are so similar. Namely, the notion of generating a proof is a different enterprise from the notion of checking a proof. Similarly, the no notion of checking whether or not a solution is correct might be easier than the notion of searching for all possible such putative solutions. So this is really the difference here. Uh, and we have to then figure out what does it really mean to guess a solution. So let's look at some, uh, uh, I don't really wanna go into all these details here, but basically anything that you can solve in polynomial time, you can also check in polynomial time, which is kind of nice. But now we come into our notion of NP complete and NP hard. And I think there was a question in the chat that flew by. So basically we're gonna rely on our notion of reduction. Remember our notion of reduction now is exactly the same as we had for Turing reduction except that now the reduction function and the decider function have to be efficient. So let's just go back to where we were before to kind of, you know, put a finer point on that and gild the lily just a little bit. Let's see. Why did it go blank? I have a very slow device, obviously. I guess I'll page back to show you instead. I'm sorry for the make, make, make you dizzy. Whoa, what's going on here? Let's just move this up like this. Sorry, you have to watch all this. Look at this again. Okay. So let's go back to looking at our examples, I think a quiv is a little bit nicer because it's actually doing some real work here. So the key thing is when we were doing Turing reducibility, we hypothesized the existence of a quiv. And the only thing that we assumed was the spec, namely that it could return a Boolean answer given G and H. We didn't put any constraint on how efficient a quiv must or must not be. Similarly for our transformer function, Turing reduce or our wrapper, if you will, we didn't say that you had to be able to transform an instance f comma a into g comma h efficiently. We said nothing about that. You could take as long as you want, as long as it decides. So what we're doing now is we're saying, we're hypothesizing a function that goes here, right? For NP completeness. And that function has to be efficient, i.e. polynomial time and size of the input. And the Turing reduce function here, this guy has to be efficient as well. It doesn't work if you take an instance of f comma a and you take a quadrillion years to compute g comma h. So both of the, I guess, blue boxes have to be polynomial time, which means the entire machine will be polynomial time. Okay, so that's what we're basically adding here. And if you understand reductions, then you kind of can start to see what the, the concept is here. 
So basically, the thing that I want to say here is that uh, the NP hard functions are basically a problem is NP hard if for every problem in NP you can reduce it to your problem X. Problem X is NP hard if you can reduce every problem in NP to it. Remember, reduce means turn computable function and moreover has to be efficient. NP complete is the same thing, but you actually know your problem is an NP, namely that you can guess an answer and verify it quickly. Now this is very abstract and it won't make a lot of sense until we look at an example. So let's look at an example. And this is what I asked you to look at before, which is the notion of a Hamiltonian cycle. So back to our study of graph problems, problems set three and so forth. There's a natural question to ask about graphs. So let's think about it. So we can ask, hey, is it possible from a starting vertex to take a tour that visits every vertex, but you can't repeat any and return to the starting vertex, right? So that's an interesting question to ask. And here's a graph where you can actually do this. So you can start at some vertex of this graph and you can tour the graph and you should be fine. I'm sorry, that's the, sec the second one is possible. The first one isn't. The graph down below, this one has a Hamiltonian cycle and this one doesn't. Or in scheme, we would say false. So in the graph at the bottom, we can start at any vertex and we can plan a path that visits all the other vertices and then returns to the start. In the top graph, it takes a little work, but we can show that that's not possible. There exist starting positions from which you cannot tour all the vertices. Okay, so we're gonna use this notion in a minute. I just wanna see if you can, you know, are comfortable with this notion of a Hamiltonian cycle. The idea that you can visit all of the vertices without repeating for a graph that has a Hamiltonian cycle and that you can't in graphs that don't. It's a fundamental property of graphs you might like to compute. Any questions on this that you'd like to ask? Yeah, so are we saying that um, it's false because there's no possible uh, Hamiltonian cycles? Or, or, or Sorry, are we saying it's true because there is a single possible Hamiltonian cycle or we can get a Hamiltonian cycle from any possible point on the graph? Yeah, those are two different problems actually. It's really, really good. So we're only asking if it just has one in this case. Okay, thank you. And there is, there is a class of problems where we ask if every cycle is Hamiltonian or if they're more than one. And those are thought to be strictly harder. They're kind of counting problems. But we're only asking if there's just one here. So in the, in the top graph, there exists no Hamiltonian cycle. In the bottom one, there does exist one. And I just wanna see if people are comfortable with that. Does that make sense to everybody? So the key thing here is that in the case where we think there's a Hamiltonian cycle at the bottom, I can check it pretty quickly, right? Like if I tell, give you the cycle, you can relatively quickly check that it visits all the vertices and it returns to the start. But in the top where I claim there isn't one, it's a little more work to prove that's the case, right? You have to kind of check all the cycles, enumerate the cycles somehow. And there are a lot of different cycles, right? They're an exponential number, in fact. So this is really the difference between our problems here, is that if there is a Hamiltonian cycle, you can check it very quickly. In fact, it'll be polynomial time, essentially linear time. You just go through the vertices, see if any left out, do you come back to the beginning, do you not repeat any vertices? Fairly straightforward to do. In order to verify that there is no Hamiltonian cycle, that's a difficult problem. You have to basically enumerate all the cycles and rule them out. So you can see why a problem like that would be, at least naively, take exponential time because there are an exponential number of possible cycles. And this is why, you know, it seems reasonable to use this notion to get at the difference, but combinatorially between polynomial and exponentially. Now, in order to think about reductions, right, we now have the same picture 
as we had before, we want to reduce Hamiltonian cycle, which is known to be hard, to some other problem y. And the only thing we're adding here is the fact that the reduction has to be efficient, i.e. polynomial time. So the reason this works is very similar to our argument for computability. Namely, suppose that we have a reduction of Hamiltonian cycle to some problem of interest y. And suppose the reduction r is polynomial time. And suppose it were also possible to decide y in polynomial time. In other words, given a scheme expression, we can decide whether or not it's in y or not and return true or false. And the function f only runs in polynomial time. So in this case, we can compose r and f, obviously decide the Hamiltonian cycle problem, but we could also do that in polynomial time. Now, this is used usually to indicate that probably such a fast decider function doesn't exist, but often the fast reducer function is crucial to doing that. So the key thing here is we compose these functions to decide the harder function, and we can look at their complexities because when you compose two polynomial functions, you only get a polynomial. So let's look at thinking about how we could do this for two particular problems. We'll look into more of this in recitation because I want to allow plenty of time for questions. So let's look at if there's some other problem here. So here's a problem you might've heard of called the traveling salesman problem. So this is sort of similar in flavor to the Hamiltonian cycle problem. Given a series of city and a traveling salesperson, we ask, well, what's the tour of these cities that is shortest? When the graph is weighted, you have edge weights on the graph. This is a very interesting problem, also combinatorially difficult. And we'd like to know whether or not this problem is harder or easier or as hard as the Hamiltonian cycle problem. Now, there are some things that are a little complicated in terms of doing this, because just like a quiv and the halting problem have different formats or different inputs, similarly, the traveling salesman problem and the Hamiltonian cycle problem have different formats or inputs. So in particular, the traveling salesman problem is an optimization problem. It's asking, find me a tour of the vertices that has the minimum weight or the smallest possible weight because that's the most efficient. Whereas the Hamiltonian cycle problem is a decision problem. It's telling you whether or not you have a Hamiltonian cycle for your graph. So we have to somehow convert between these. And to do this, we use a trick, and this will be the first time any of you have seen it, is we basically produce what's called decision variant of the traveling salesman problem. In other words, if I have an optimization problem that's able to give me the shortest tour of a bunch of cities, I might be able to write, do the following. I can query it and say, hey, is there a tour that's shorter than 157 miles? And it says yes or no. Obviously I could do something like binary search and iterate that if I wanted to get more information. But basically the decision variant of the traveling salesman problem now ask the question, is there a tour less than a certain distance D? We can use this trick to look at the relative difficulty of the Hamiltonian cycle problem and the traveling salesman problem. And here's sort of the trick to do this. Now, I've actually written out the code here, but I wanna give you the idea for this. So first of all, look at, look at how the inputs are different. For a graph to be in, the set ham of Hamiltonian cycles, all it has to be is a graph. I mean, it might or not have the cycle property, but all it is is a graph. Whereas to be inside the traveling salesman problem, like we have to have a more complicated thing. So basically there has to be a function w that tells you the weights of all the edges, i.e. a high order function. And there has to be this threshold k. So we're asking in the graph g prime, is there a tour of less than length k given a weight function that tells you the weight of each edge, just like you had on problem set three. So what I'd like to be able to do is transform instances of ham into instances of TSPD. In other words, you give me an instance of the Hamiltonian graph problem and I turn it into the TSPD and I do that in polynomial time. So the trick is as follows. I'm taking in an unweighted graph and I want to produce a weighted graph, right? And so what I'm going to do is the following trick. I basically get to write the weight function, which is a high order procedure that gives me the weights here. And what I'm going to do is the following. 
if in my original graph, which in this case is G here, if in the original graph, there's an edge between two vertices, I'll make the edge in the new graph be one. If there's no edge between a pair of vertices, I'll make the weight be two. So this way, if there's a decider for TSPD, namely if there is a Boolean function that given a graph, a weight function on the edges and a threshold K says yes, if there is a traveling salesman tour of weight less than K. That will be true if and only if the original graph G was a Hamiltonian cycle. So that's what I've essentially done here. Basically there's a choice here. I make a new graph that has weight, weights of edges one and two, and then I can reduce the Hamiltonian cycle problem to the traveling salesman problem, showing that one is at least as hard as the other. So this is again, the wrapper style, which is fine. Um, uh, but the wrapper is around a transformer. So what I wanted to indicate to you is these transformers can be relatively complicated things, but we have to show that this is polynomial time. I won't do that here, but you can pretty quickly verify that this actually can run polynomial time. So what this means is that if we have a transformer that can convert between a known hard problem, Hamiltonian cycle, and another problem we're trying to prove is hard, such as traveling salesmen. If the transformer runs in polynomial time, and if the decider runs in polynomial time, then the composition of those two functions also runs in polynomial time. Since we don't believe that will be possible, you now in a position to go to your boss and say, well, it's equivalent to these really hard problems and no one knows how to solve these at this time. So I don't wanna go into the details of, of you know, proving this in this lecture, but we'll do some of that in recitation. But the key point that I wanted to make is that we have a good foundation now for understanding why the halting problem is hard and how to prove that other problems are hard using reductions. That same basic strategy can be used to prove that problems are unlikely to have solutions that run in polynomial time. Namely, in the same way that before, we took a very hard problem, the halting problem, and we reduced it to a problem of interest that we think is hard by defining a transformer that merely had to be computable. And then hypothesizing that the new problem was decidable. Because decidability of two functions composes, that would give us a contradiction because we'd be deciding the halting problem. In this other case here, the conclusion we reach is not a contradiction per se. What we reach instead is the following. When we have a problem like Hamiltonian cycle, which we believe is very difficult or impossible to solve in polynomial time, what we do is we take a new problem of interest whose complexity is unknown but suspected to be high, namely the traveling salesman problem. And in this case, we do two things. First, we write a reducer. The reducer takes instances of the Hamiltonian cycle problem and converts them into instances of traveling salesman problem. And first of all, this function has to be, of course, Turing computable by a scheme function. But second, we require it to be polynomial time as well, so it doesn't do something crazy expensive. Then, given that we can transform instances of HAM into TSP, we then hypothesize what would happen if there exists an efficient decider for TSP namely a function that given a graph, a weight function for the edges and a threshold K returned a Boolean answer when there exists a tour or a cycle that had weight less than K. If the reducer, it can be proven to exist, which you can do by constructing it and showing that it's sufficient. And if the hypothetical decider exists, then you can compose the reducer and the decider in the same way that you did when proving problems are hard by the halting problem. When you've composed them, of course you get a function that decides the Hamiltonian path problem. But because composing two polynomial time functions gives you a polynomial time function, the resulting composition of the reducer and the decider is going to give you a polynomial time decision procedure for Hamiltonian cycle. This doesn't give us a contradiction per se, but it contradicts in some sense or is in opposition to our received knowledge 
or our belief that we cannot solve the Hamiltonian cycle problem in polynomial time. And hence we come back to our skits by Omar and Daniel or a cartoon here, is that if you can do this and your boss or your program manager or your Lieutenant Colonel tells you to solve a problem and you can reduce the Hamiltonian cycle problem to your problem in polynomial time, then what you've essentially done is you've shown that your problem is as hard as any NP hard problem. And you also know that you can't be replaced by another computer scientist, most of whom have said they can't solve these problems. So what we're doing is we're showing equivalent hardness. If we had a rock solid proof that Ham was actually uh, impossible to write in polynomial time, we would have a contradiction and a rock solid proof that your new problem Y or TSP was like that. Instead, what we have is a consensus of scientists right now that say, we don't know how to do it. We think it's probably impossible. But the strongest evidence that you might have is if you have some new problem that arises in say biology, chemistry, network allocation, finance, wherever you're working, and you prove that you can reduce ham to it in polynomial time, probably that means your problem is very hard. If it's not, it means you have found a solution to every NP complete problem that runs in polynomial time, which we believe is very unlikely. So it's a good way to give a very strong indication of the hardness of your problem. So there's a lot of concepts here, but the main thing is you need a generalization of the halting problem to things that are merely thought to be hard with strong evidence. And second, you need to add to reductions the notion that they run in polynomial time. But then the theory of reductions, which we've learned now and you've been playing around with, carries over directly to be the backbone of complexity theory, namely whether or not functions are NP-complete or not. The probably greatest open question to resolve in computer science, but for now we can classify our problems as to their hardness relative to other ones. Okay, so with that, I want to um, end the lecture per se, but I'm going to stay around and take questions for anyone who would like to talk about this or any other questions involving the class. Uh, I'm more than, more than happy to do that. Uh, so we'll stop the recording at this point, but I will um, stay around for essentially office hours. If you'd like to talk to me, please um, stay around and we can chat and answer questions and so forth. Okay, great. Thank you all very much.